Uh, my name is Khalil. Uh, Our next presenter will be Ms. Sasha Smalls. Um, Sasha is from Valley Street North High School. And at this time, Sasha, can you please share your screen to begin your presentation? Um, can you see my screen? Not yet, no. Okay, how about now? Yes, there you go. All right, perfect. Okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is Sasha Smalls, and today I will be presenting an article from the Journal of Science and Medicine and Sport, and the article title is Guidelines for Community-Based Injury Surveillance in Rugby Union. So briefly, I'd just like to cover a few bullet points about this article. So first and foremost, community-based rugby is the, the players in community-based rugby house the majority of people that play rugby. So this does not include professional or elite players. Um, and in an effort to gauge the risk of these athletes, the World Rugby in 2006, they sat down and they made a, consens a consensus statement. And this was to provide definitions and data collection protocols for rugby injuries. Now, although I mentioned that community-based rugby players compose the majority of rugby players, these reports were mainly reporting elite and professional game. So what they found was that community-based rugby players and their teams were lacking qualified medical personnel. And as a result, they weren't able to participate in a lot of this consent. They weren't able to fit into the consensus statement and report their injuries. So the world rugby is realizing that they're, have, they have a gap in knowledge on a lot of these injury reports and they're unable to correctly uh, surveillance this data. So, that leads me to the aim of the paper, which was to identify areas where the consensus statement could be adapted for easier and more appropriate implementation within the community setting. So like I said, the World Rugby, they um, sponsored a meeting in 2006. So now they need to host a new meeting in order to reevaluate this consensus statement and make it more inclusive towards the community-based players and their lack of medical per, uh, personnel. So they decided to do a replication of what they did in 2006, which, which was to host a two-day roundtable discussion. And they gathered 11 members that were qualified uh, for their specific expertise. And this ranged from being a trauma specialist, or some of them were actually at the meeting in 2006. And this just allowed them to reevaluate the consensus statement to be more inclusive and to meet their aim. So the meeting followed a predefined 12 point agenda. And one of the members was chosen, one of the members that was actually present at the 2006 um, World Rugby meeting. And that member facilitated the, uh, the the meetings and another member would scribe down any points or discussion points that were made or any questions or concerns that came up. So the manuscript that came out of these meetings, it went through seven rounds of iterative review, which basically refers to a process in which the stakeholders that are participating in the meeting provide immediate feedback. So they get the manuscript and then they're actively editing it to uh, improve the consensus statement and make it more inclusive towards the community-based players. So the results of this meeting and their methodology was a new injury surveillance form that they plan to be more inclusive towards these community-based teams. And I would just like to point out that one of the um, hallmarks was that non-medical professionals could now fill out this form. So this included the coaching staff. Um, as opposed to a paid athletic trainer. So, so some of the things that they improved on that I would like to point out are that 
is that um, injuries requiring medical attention were not included. And at first you might question why medical attention, which may make the injury seem more severe, why those are being explicitly uh, not included and actually the reason for this is because at the community clubs, the qualifications of medical support can vary largely between uh, you know, heavily sponsored teams and less sponsored teams. So the, the group that had the discussion, the World Rugby group, group, they decided that this could lead to inconsist inconsistencies in the data. So they decided to exclude any injuries that included that uh, required medical attention. A, another point, another thing to point out is that they allowed rugby-based and academic slash occupational time loss to be recorded. So like I said, this was to be more inclusive towards the community-based teams. So community-based teams might not have a, um, they, they're not necessarily getting paid for their time on the team. So they might have to go to work the next morning. And if they're missing out on work, that could indicate a more severe injury than um, if they just, lost time on the field because the field their time on the field wasn't the only source of income or wasn't a source of income at all so it could evidence more severe or more important injuries if they had to miss out on schooling or or work time um another point is that location parameters and the body and a body figure was included in the injury surveillance so there was a physical diagram that you could use in order to locate these injuries and this made it more um, easy. This made it easier for non-medical professionals to locate injuries and it became more consistent, more consistent definitions of these injuries um, over a long period of time. And then also record match and training exposures to risk uh, for each. They recorded re uh, match and training exposures to risk um, differently based on the settings. And basically this was because the level and type of exposure varies greatly amongst professional and community-based rugby players. So if um, exposure is the denominator and the number of reported injuries is the numerator, so the calculation would be incidents. So they decided to use this as a manner of calculating incidents because they felt it was more inclusive to the community-based and professional-based because it varied less to calculate it in this way. So they were, they, they decided to record these um, match and train exposures separately. And next, uh, they also decided that comparing risk based, risk, injury risk based on prevalence um, was, they decided to make this proportional because, for example, if Club A has 60 players and 15 get injured, the incidence is 25%. However, if Club B has 100 players and 20 get injured, the incidence now becomes uh, uh, 20%. So I'm sorry, I think I said 25% or 20% before. Um, so it just made it more proportional to um, compare the risk in between the professional and community-based players because the teams might be larger or smaller. So that is the conclusion of my presentation on this article. Um, I would now like to open the floor to any questions. Very nice work there, Sasha. There are limitations in data collection community-wise. I think what happens is that that's why we've standardized it with athletic trainers. Um, the importance here is um, there's a paper that was out by Dr. Collins. Uh, this is the group out of um, Ohio. Um, and they did the first high school paper the importance is that data paper evaluating data collection between an athletic trainer and a team staff member, coach, and found out there was something like, I think an 80% error rate by the coaching staff. They're not healthcare providers. They're not gonna know anatomy. They're not, uh, you know, you can expect, you could put a picture of a body and hope that they do know the difference between a leg and a shin or a thigh and a leg. You understand? So it's hard 
for them to document or expect them to document at that level of incidence, um, let alone to correctly give you the exposure. Um, so I, I do, I will have to quote that paper that was in Journal of Athletic Training. And one of the authors was Collins. And I think they stated exactly that no coach or non uh, healthcare provider should be collecting data to be used by a governing body for evaluation of mitigation of injury reduction. So um, I'd have to stay firm on that. And I think that this is going to be, I know what they're, they're doing. You know, they, they, they're not gonna collect medical, not, they're only gonna collect time loss injuries. So basically you're right there going to collect all severe injuries as we can guess, you know, that this would be a, probably a, you know, an ACL or a concussion, the top ones, but you're going to miss everything else, even the recurrence and maybe the subsequent injuries that built up to this injury. Maybe even the, uh, the, um, uh, the, you know, lack of uh, balance, the lack of uh, proper, uh, and I think Erica Marcano, the athletic trainer, says it the best. If your body's not in tune and physically, uh, you know, prepared, um, so you say you have a, a weakness on one side or, you know, an imbalance, these imbalances will, will reflect in high level sport. And this is where we start talking about seconds, particularly in Olympians, right? These imbalances cause losses of seconds, um, lack of repetitive, you know, uh, volleying uh, for ball, la lack of, uh, you know, capability of continually tackling with the right shoulder. And everyone can understand what I'm talking about here. And even juking, you know, so lateral juking, you roll your foot on that ball soccer wise, and you know that's going to plague you six to eight weeks, maybe longer if you're forced, depending on the injury. So, again, I think it's very hard. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think it's a great ambition to try to do that, but I do think there's limitations. Now, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, everyone can understand that. Please continue. Are there any additional questions for Sasha? Okay, with that being said, thank you, Sasha, for that excellent presentation. Um, I'd like to continue on to our next presenter for Journal Club. That would be Ms. Liliana Tassovac. So Liliana is a student at Binghamton University. And Liliana, at this time, would you like to share your screen to present? Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Um, so thank you, Jasmine, for the introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I will be presenting the article, Tackler's Head Position Relative to the Ball Carrier is Highly Correlated with Head and Neck Injuries in Rugby by um, Shogu Sabu and colleagues. So to begin, um, prior to 2000, severe head and neck injuries occurred most in rugby game, game play. Um, however, due to new safety measures, basically teaching kids how to correctly tackle and correctly play the game, um, the incidence has decreased significantly, we, which we have seen um, the incidence for any injuries above the neck level have just gone down by a large margin. So alongside this, um, in correlation with the new safety measures, um, stiff arm tackles and high tackles um, have been made illegal in the game because as researchers have seen, these two types of tackles are in extreme correlation with both severe head and neck injuries. Um, although we have seen preventative and safety measures uh, implemented into the sport, it is found that an injury most commonly occurs as a result of a tackler's head position. So I'll just give some 
uh, background explanation of what this is. A tackler's correct head position would be a tackler wrapping, wrapping their arms around the opponent with their head located under the person's either left or right arm, basically um, pushing the head out of any direct contact with the other, the opponent or the ground or the ball. But uh, it was, it's commonly seen that a tackler uh, sometimes doesn't think before going into a tackle and their head makes direct contact with the opponent in which this would be considered an incorrect uh, head position. So if the tackler continues to use this incorrect head position while completing a safe tackle, even though they might not be doing a stiff arm or a high tackle, this can result in this one of these um, severe injuries. So with that being said, it becomes extremely important to understand a safe head position in accordance with the injury incidents. So in this study, um, researchers used two university rugby teams um, and in the injury incidence rates were calculated over the course of two years in 2015, 2016. And to do so, um, they analyzed 28 videos of game footage. So the way they did this is that um, for the 28 videos they had, they every time a tackle occurred, they would analyze the tackle um, from the player that they were studying. So if a player made a tackle, they were placed into either a tackler with correct head positioning or a tackler with incorrect head positioning. And if the tackler was placed into the category being incorrect um, head positioning, the player was asked to complete a follow-up questionnaire to understand kind of why they did this tackle. And some of the questions that were asked is, um, their experience with rugby, like how much they knew about the sport, if they were taught certain rules and certain safety measures, um, how, what position they played, because that's extremely important in understanding um, why they may have done this. And one of the most important questions they asked is if the tackle, like if their head positioning was intentional, habitual, or unintentional, and it just kind of happened because they were trying to make a play. And then once all this data was recorded, a chi-squared test was used to compare the incidences. So looking at the results, um, this was one of the tables which was included. And in the first two sections, we could see that they had, they totaled all the injuries for the tackle, tackles with incorrect head position and tackles with correct head position. And uh, within the red circle, we could see that there per a thousand player hours, there were only 295 tackles with incorrect head positioning and um, with correct head positioning, there was 3,643. So clearly there were a lot more tackles using um, correct head positioning, which is very promising because it means that people are listening to safety and preventative measures. But as we could see, although there were significantly less tackles with incorrect head positioning, the injury incidence rate was significantly higher across the total concussions, neck injuries, stingers, shoulder injuries, any like injuries above the neck, which proves that although players are practicing like safe behaviors when um, tackling during gameplay, uh, if they if they slightly mess up and their head goes in the wrong way, their likeliness of obtaining a severe injury go goes up uh, marginally. And then, so in these two um, data sets, in the first table, um, this was the 317 total tackles with incorrect head positioning. And the research researchers kind of looked at just the age with the mean being 19.8. So it was college level athletes. Um, and then they mostly looked at the position because another thing that um, they asked was they looked at was the pre-contact and post-contact phase, meaning how many steps a tackler would take before they um, made the tackle or how many, how long it took for them to make a tackle. And we could see that there, most of the positions with the incorrect tackling was in the back. So the back players um, had the most incorrect head positioning when making a tackle. And then in table four, um, from what I was saying before with the whole questionnaire, um, the most important question was if um, the tackle with incorrect head positioning was intentional or unintentional. And as we can see, um, the main cause of the tackles was in fact unintentional. So it proves that a player might have just been too invested in the game and they kind of just went for the tackle just and they didn't really realize where their head was going and it caused them to have 
um, that incorrect head positioning, which could have led to a severe injury. And although um, we do see some results being intentional incorrect head positioning, that kind of may result from how the player was taught um, rugby and just um, their experience with the game. So to kind of uh, conclude, along with the both tackle types, um, as I was saying before, the, both, the pre and post contact tackle phases were investigated. So this helped extremely, helped researchers extremely because it helped them um, understand these incidence rates. So for example, um, with players that had longer pre-contact phases, which as I said before, was a lot of players in the backfield, this um, helped in injury prevention because if there was a longer pre-contact phase, it was shown that the player had more time to fix their head positioning and go into the tackle the correct way instead of the incorrect way. So um, after these results were found, uh, they were able to teach other players to maybe take a, a few more steps or a little bit more time before they make that tackle so they can prevent themselves from receiving a severe injury to the, their head or their neck. Um, so in doing so, they were able to find these preventative measures, not only just for outside backs, but for all positions across the field, even though the incidence rates were a little bit lower um, in like the front and the fly positions. So overall, this incorrect head positioning that has been seen commonly throughout rugby uh, causes severe head and neck injuries. And it should be, this um, should definitely be explained thoroughly when teaching rugby, especially in younger athletes. So when, an athlete may be just learning the sport, this should uh, definitely be taught um, very intensely and made sure of because if their head positioning is incorrect, like they can, their incidence rate for getting a concussion, neck injury, anything like that increases significantly. And some limitations that uh, were in the study is that the sample size was a little bit small um, using only two university teams they didn't have too many athletes to look at. And also researchers like in the future, uh, they should investigate these incidence rates amongst professional and younger athletes to get a long, like a larger age range because it could, the incidence rates may be a lot higher in younger athletes because they're much more unaware of this head positioning. And then it might be much lower in professionals because they are taught and understand the game a little bit better. So thank you for listening and now I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Thank you for your excellent presentation, Juliana. And as she mentioned, um, if anyone has any questions or Dr. Lopez, if you would like to add any remarks. I have a question if you wouldn't mind, Liliana. Um, I was just wondering, I know that this study was used uh, using video footage of the rugby games, but how did they decide if using rugby, uh, using video footage, if a tackle was intentional versus unintentional? Um, so they used the footage to kind of analyze every single tackle that was across any games and tournaments. But if they noticed that a tackle was, there was incorrect head positioning, the players were asked to complete a follow-up questionnaire and they, the players watched their tackle like as it happened. And then they were able to determine if it was intentional or unintentional. Thank you so much. That clarifies a lot. Did they use, um, sorry, they didn't use the video consensus statement, right? When they looked at these tackles? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm looking at the um, references right now. It doesn't look like they did. Um, like I said, um, so now they came up with a consensus statement of looking at video videography for injuries and that. Um, but it looks like they use some of the um, variables in here. Uh, especially the pre, pre tackle, the tackle, and the post tackle. They're considering all three phases of that to be an area to be looked into regarding their injuries. Um, but again, I think this is a very good paper. 
and um, I think the uh, the causes, you know, very interesting. The accident, unintentional, and accidental. Very interesting. Again, it adds to the literature, understanding what's going on. Thank you, Lily. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay, lovely. So our final presenter for the night will be Ms. Lauren Morrell. So Lauren is a student at University of California, Berkeley. Um, she will be presenting the influence of playing surfaces on injury risk in elite rugby players. Um, Lauren, if you'd like to share your screen at this time and begin our final presentation of the night. Can I have everyone see? I think it went off screen. I can't see it. Give me a moment. That better? Yes. Hey everyone, as Jasmine mentioned, I my name is Lauren Morell and I will be a senior at the University of California, Berkeley. Sorry, my series. Please forgive. So sorry about that. I'll start again. Um, and I will be presenting a paper on the influence of playing surface on injury risk in Italian elite rugby players. And this was published in the Muscle, Ligaments, and Tendons Journal in 2017. So the aim of this investigation was to investigate the risk of acute and overuse injuries on artificial turf versus natural grass. So while grass is the traditional playing surface for the pitch or the fields that rugby is played on, uh, turf technology is being examined for places that lack the resources uh, to maintain a grass pitch so that we can expand uh, rugby participation into new areas or underserved areas or simply areas that don't have the climate to sustain uh, natural grass. Um, currently, third, synth third generation synthetic turf is being used that comprises of a stone base, shock pad, carpet, and rubber infill, um, which is ensured to replicate good quality grass. And this was um, enacted by World Rugby in which they passed Regulation 22 that, in, that insisted that there was good quality turf being used. Um, and it's really interesting. I believe this study was being done because uh, this study of turf is being examined in European soccer and American football, as in American football, it's been reported to significantly increase rates of injuries. So for this study, they looked at two professional Italian rugby teams and the medical professionals initially recorded a baseline um, in medical history, uh, just to get, just to get, just to get any ongoing um, medical issues going on. Following that, um, throughout 300 training sessions and 18 matches in the 2014-2015 seasons, um, the medical professionals recorded their injuries during the matches and training, and the injuries were defined as a sprain, strain, or contusion, or any other injury that took them out of the game for one or more days. So as this uh, article demonstrated the artificial turf seems to be as safe as grass for traumatic injuries, um, but it is a risk factor for overuse injuries. Um, and, and one of the reasons for this could be that the trauma traumatic injuries that we normally think of with rugby injuries, such as those acute injuries or tackling injuries, are player to player contact dependent and are usually not dependent on the uh, playing surface. 
um, another interesting fact that was studied in this article was that muscle soreness was statistically higher on an artificial turf following matches, uh, which could down the line lead to future um, successive matches in performance um, in future trainings and matches. So for the discussion, um, I would like to discuss why overuse injuries were more common than traumatic injuries. I know I mentioned that already this was due to uh, the contact of the traumatic injuries, but it's also been extrapolated that the foot surface traction with the turf impacts the vertical forces that are pushed through the bottom of the foot and the lower limbs and the soft tissue that um, that kind of foster those overuse injuries so such stress fractures or muscle injuries and strains. Um, so I think moving forward, this article kind of evaluates the fact that we weren't able to, they were not able to look at the specific types of injuries that occurred on the turf versus the grass. Um, in European soccer, it's found that ankle and knee ligament injuries are a lot higher on turf than they are on normal grass. Um, so I think moving forward, it'd be great to do continued surveillance to allow for the analysis of specific injury diagnoses um, and look at the injury and risk associated with that. Um, and then lastly, a few questions I kind of wanted to propose for thinking was just, will world rugby standardize grass instead of turf? Just because if there is an increase in this overuse injuries, would it even be like worth it at all to allow players to play on such long amounts of time for grass on turf? Um, I think another question that's inter, I apologize, that's interesting coming up um, with the Olympics is will they play on grass or turf? I was doing some research and I wasn't able to find it, but moving forward in future places with countries that maybe aren't able to maintain a grass or that places that need to do indoor, um, are they gonna play on grass or turf and have a standardization of that? Um, and then lastly, just kind of like a public health inquiry, do we think as this um, article discussed, the reason of turf is to kind of expand rugby and get to those places that don't have grass. Do we think getting more young children or even adults or just expanding the rugby community is worth an increase in overuse injuries that could be detrimental to them playing the sport at all in the long run? Um, so just some questions to ponder. Um, here are my references and the contact information of the article writers. And then I'd like to thank you. Here's my contact information if anyone has questions. Um, and I, I would love to answer any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Lauren, for the excellent presentation. And at this time, as Lauren has mentioned, um, we'd like to open it up to questions. And Dr. Lopez, if you have anything to add. I actually have a question. Uh, I've noticed that some of the sevens tournaments actually occur on beaches. So I was wondering how um, how it would compare uh, sand compared to natural grass or artificial turf. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we don't. I actually, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was gonna say we don't look at uh, tournaments on sand. First of all, just to clarify. Yeah, I, I actually didn't know that even was the case. Um, I think the standards for turf for safety are so high, as I was mentioning, the World Rugby has this organization that tests the turf, turf before play. So I imagine if the standards are that high for turf, the safety qual qualities are probably a lot lower in sand, which is probably, I'm assuming Dr. Lopez, why we don't look at them. Uh, I know the world rugby definitely um, has a standardization. I think it's very also very costly to install the type of artificial turf that they would allow. Um, so therefore, uh, sanctioning an event by world rugby takes a lot of effort. Um, obviously, uh, it has to make sure that the grass is appropriately cut, uh, has a certain breed of, of certain species of grass. Um, and then um, again, I think any match played on artificial turf has to uh, reach the standards of world rugby levels. Um, again, um, we're looking at this data now uh, for ourselves as well, or 
about to start. Um, this is an area that they've always stated. I think the biggest problem with the overuse injuries is the hardy or the hardness of the turf and its effect on cleat wear. Yes, you get better traction with cleats on artificial grass with a cleat, but it's also, um, you can imagine how difficult or stiff it would be with your foot within the boot. Um, um, uh, you know, and therefore, um, you know, you have, you know, uh, less overuse injuries on grass because it's giving. It's quite uh, intolerable of impacts. Uh, if you tackle someone uh, on grass, the grass and the soil will give, uh, but with an artificial turf, it's almost, uh, I think some of them have the concrete slab and they fill it up with a uh, rubber tire. And then now, um, you know, there's so many factors to that. Um, uh, you just can go on and on, but I won't digress. The more important thing is, I do think the big uh, factor there for uh, overuse injuries is that you have the hard sole of the uh, cleat and then the hard surface underneath that ground up tire or whatever product that's there. And so that's really what's giving you that overuse or turf toe, Achilles tendonitis, fasciitis, the overuse injuries. But uh, again, I would uh, assume playing on uh, sand, uh, training on sand has a whole different uh, depth to that. Um, but we'll talk about that another time. Um, but anyway, um, but again, um, please, Eric, John, I hope I answered your question. You did, thank you. I have another quick question. When considering training or competition, do you know if there's any evidence to suggest that switching playing surfaces, so training on turf and then playing on grass or vice versa could increase injury risk? Hmm, interesting. Um, I have not seen any literature out there about that, but um, it is something to take into consideration and uh, maybe a concluding sentence we should include. Uh, Kira, in case you're curious, I could speak anecdotally that um, certain football teams at colleges I know, if they have access to both grass and turf fields, will switch practice for the week pending like what their competition field may be. Um, so that, but I do wonder if there is any research to like back that up. I'm also very curious, and Lauren, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe your paper looked at abrasions, which I feel would be highly increased in turf. Um, turf and like, burn. Turf burn, so especially in a tackling population, um, I can imagine that could extensive abrasion or extensive turf burn can like lead to um, some pretty bad contusions on your knees and so on and so forth. So it's just curious that I feel like they didn't address that when that's, um, I feel like a major drawback to artificial turf in a rugby playing population. And are there any additional questions? Okay, so that concludes our journal club portion for this evening. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined in on Zoom, as well as everyone who joined in on our conference call. Um, and I hope you guys all have a great remainder of your evening. Thank you.